I think brands are just so interested in the quick win. <laughs> and we cannot think about the quick win when it comes to fandom because yeah. it's really like a deep time commitment and something that people think of as part of their identity. And if you're going to be talking and participating in something that means that much to somebody, yeah. you need to show that much care back because yeah, otherwise it's just not going to work. Hello and welcome back to The Alchemists, a limited series podcast you quickly come to know as your own personal sort of concierge of interesting things that you've learned at State of Social 2024. My name is Andres Lopez Varela, you can call me ALV, uh, or you can be like that one friend actually who calls me Alv and then everyone thinks my name is actually Alvin, when it's not. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind. Today we are recording on the traditional lands of the Wajak Noongar people, live at State of Social 2024. And I'm I'm super interesting and dare I say a very somewhat surprising combination um, of alchemists joining us on the show today to understand how we can build bridges by finding common ground um, between brands and, and fandoms. Before we dive in, I'll remind you the whole series of The Alchemist is uh, now live wherever you get your podcasts. So make sure you hit that subscribe button to see all the episodes in your feed. All right, let's make the magic happen. Joining me today in the studio are three alchemists, including Dave Stewart, whose day job as an intellectual property lawyer at law firm Bennett, but lies the fact that he's also an experienced comic book editor. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. It's a unique introduction. Yeah. Most people don't kind of mash the two together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one or the other. I've done the research. Yeah. You know? You're on it. <laughs> uh, we also have our fan engagement expert, Dr. Georgie Carroll. How are you, Georgie? Hi, I'm well, thank you. Excited to be here for this convo. Yeah, we're gonna, no doubt it's going to be so good. And uh, speaking of nerds, James Watley, brand and gaming strategist. How are you, James? Hello. I'm very well. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Very happy to have you as part of this chat. Welcome to the show. Um, now, each of you here has kind of a unique and quite different experience um, understanding some type of fandom and the power it has to create deep and strong connections, you know, between people uh, and also, you know, big, strong parts of people's identity. It seems like, you know, being like a, like a real ride or die fan of a hobby or of a performer or a, a fictional character or a sporting team or a TV show or whatever, um, maybe even a brand is something that can be truly formative for our identity. Like you asked me about Formula One strategy directors or crew members in Star Trek or Hot Ones episodes, you'll instantly <laughs> know everything about me. Um, so I want to start first by asking you about something that you're a fan of and how you kind of came to that fandom. I'm going to start with you, Dave. Oh, good grief. All right. Um, so in 1982, I went to a news agency and there was a comic there called All Star Squadron and it featured members of the golden age of comics from 19, the 1940s. Wow. And ever since then, at a young, impressionable age, being exposed to the golden age Green Lantern and the golden age Flash... I've been a solid fan of these sort of now quite dated sort of concepts that were first originated as a way of getting Americans behind the war effort. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, there you go. And how did you go from – I'll definitely get to the to, – to, 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 <laughs> how did you get from there to the like actually working on you – know, were involved in the editorial side of comic books? Oh, so uh, – oh, God, that's a long and wandering path. So I, I – after I specialised in intellectual property law, I went and worked in Hong Kong for a while. And when I worked in Hong Kong for a firm called Deacons, who we're all still very good friends, they were uh, doing work for both Marvel and DC Comics. Okay. I think the most interesting dispute that I was involved in there was chasing someone for using the Chinese characters for Superman on underpants. <laughs> so it was obviously conveying some sort of message that DC didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and from there, I kind of had my interest in comics revived and I'd rocked up in a strange city. I was going on the old DC Comics message board and found that there was a whole community out there of other people who also liked Golden Age Green Lantern and Golden Age Flash unexpectedly and and kind of got stuck or drawn back into it after yeah. sort of two decades of disinterest. That's amazing. Mm. That's such a great story. So nice to have that spark kind of reignited, I guess. Every now and again. Years. Yeah. Yes. Georgie, what about you? Yeah, so gosh... I am a fan of so many things, mm. but um, I will tell you that I became a fan, like many other people, of Formula One in recent years oh. uh, because of Drive to Survive. Yes, yes. Um, a friend sat me down one day and said, we're going to watch Drive to Survive, and I said, I couldn't care less about cars. Yep. Um, by the end of that day, I had tickets to the Melbourne Grand Prix. Um, oh, I, fast. I was fast. I was in, in deep. Um, there was just something about the combination of 
you know, a, va- a pretty interesting sport with the personalities mm. and the relationships between the team members and the overall teams and the team principals. Um, and I love a reality TV show. I love a dramatic <laughs> TV Best show. Really, yeah. um, people complain that it's true dramatised and it's not real. That's why I love it. I love the little petty arguments and when you can tell it's fake, I know some of the arguments are fake. I'm here for it anyway. Uh, So, yeah, I've now been to three Melbourne Grand Prix. Um, uh, Deep, I wake up in the middle of the night to (laughs) uh, watch, yeah, cars drive in circles. Um, It it hooked me. Thanks, Netflix. (laughs) Yeah, it did its job, right? It did its job very effectively. And and, and Gunter Steiner, they they did did the job. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. (laughs) I've been a fan for a long time of Formula Mm. One. Um, and my, like you maybe, Dave, my sort of interest had slightly waned throughout the mid 2010s, mm. and then that came. And I was, but I was still kind of following it, but not that closely. Started watching Drive to Survive again, and I was like, "Oh, this is this is as good as I remember it." Like back in the early 2000s. So yeah, it's 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 been such a great thing for the sport. Oh yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, except not good for the price of tickets. Tickets. That's <laughs> right. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, James. Uh, I think we were talking about this before the break because in I was just in George's talk uh, and George did a great job of pulling apart the difference between eyeballs, the audience, mm. fans and fandoms. Fandoms being much more active and participatory, right? Is that mm. right? Have I yes, remembered that correct. correctly? I wasn't allowed my notebook. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and I think if I'm being true to that definition, there's a game that I, that I used to call my mainline drug called <laughs> Destiny 2 mm. and I've probably played about 3,000 hours in that game um, but there's things you when you when you complete things in that game you can get medals um, if you there's a raid that happens if you complete the raid within the first raid week you can qualify to buy a raid jacket which is a limited edition and only people that have completed that particular raid wow, get yeah. to wear it I've got one yeah. <laughs> um, and when I go to my nerd conferences I know wear it and there's other people wearing it it's like yeah yeah game, game yeah. recognised game that's my fandom yeah that's quite a fandom too yeah, I love that. I and mean, we've talked a bit about the last couple of days about our shared love of gaming as well. So I feel like I'm a very good company because all your fandoms I'm I'm totally on board with as well. So I couldn't have picked this combination yeah. better myself, you know. Um, so I, and I think that that is one of the really interesting things about um, fandom. And I, I do take your point, uh, James, you said, and Georgie, about that distinction, you know, from audience all the way down to kind of fandom being the more sort of active mm. um, participants that contribute to, to that community. Um, so we're talking about that kind of fandom, right? So it seems that that sort of style of, of community around a particular thing, if you like, um, can create bonds and connections that are long-lasting, very deep uh, and very meaningful. And even, you know, they might go away for a while, like in your case, Dave, and then they come back like 20 years later, for example, right? If I'm a marketer that seems some sees some kind of connection between what my brand's audience is about and what my brand kind of stands for and the fans of a particular, you know, person, performer, thing, sports, subculture, how do you suggest I start to even think about getting involved with that group of people to to just signal that we might have something in common? Where would you suggest, Georgie, that we start? I think it's important to start um, by making sure you know whether that relationship is truly there or, and it's not just you being like, oh, I, I quite like, I can see something here, let's dive all the way in. So doing research before you dive into anything, making sure that, you know, the alignment is there, that you can add value um, and you're not just jumping on board a trend because fans see right through that. Um, If you dive in and you're like, oh, hey, look at us, we're this brand, come, like, you know, buy something, come, Mm -hmm. come love us, we're taking over here, that's, they will not like you for that. You have to be authentic. Um, It has to be meaningful. Um, And a lot of the time I would even say, brands shouldn't get involved in yeah. those ways because it it's so poorly done 99% of the time um, because fandoms are at their heart, you know, they, they're communities of fans away from brands a lot of the time where mm. the fans share a passion for something and, yeah, they'll talk about, you know, whether it's the film or the comic book or the sport, but then they also are building friendships and relationships yeah. And it's that love of the what I call the object of fandom um, is what initially drew them together, but then it kind of can expand beyond that. And they don't they don't really want brands coming in. They don't even necessarily want the the official the object, the, the object yeah. um, in there all of the time. And it, 
it, you just have to be very careful, I think, if you're trying to get involved as a brand. And, James, I know we, you were talking about this yesterday with gaming um, and how, you know, even in advertising, brands get it quite wrong when they don't understand gaming properly. And I think we see the exact same thing in fandom where there's just a lack of knowledge sometimes and they think it's something to jump into for easy engagement and eyeballs and it can just backfire because the fans see through it. Let's talk a little bit about gaming because I want to get to those specific ones where, you know, it's sort of where fandom is is sort of a disproportionately large group of the community perhaps. Now, as Georgie said, you spoke yesterday, James, about um, the different levels or the different depth that you could go to with yeah. uh, being involved in those communities in different ways. I don't, I don't want you to reiterate your, your, your talk, but I, I do want you to maybe um, pick up that point that Georgie mentioned about sort of asking for permission first, I guess, and doing that research. How does that relate to that concept of how deep that you, you might go? Like if, for example, you do your research and you're like, oh, it's not really right here, the vibe might be off, can we still do a little bit or, you know, should we, should we back off completely? So I would want to I want to build on Georgie's point completely in that um, you've got to find your right in. Like, mm. do I have the right to be in this space? Mm. And that might be something as unique as the CEO of my company is a Destiny 2 player. Mm. So therefore, we know they're a fan. Mm. So come on in, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That is a, a unique way in mm. and you've got the right to play. Um, I was trying to think about a different example um, but this is kind of this is kind of different, and it's about act activating communities. We talked about a little bit about this over breakfast this morning. One of my favourite examples of a community coming together uh, and proving their fandom. There's a game called No Man's Sky, and there's never been a brand involved with it. And I can't, and I look at it, and I like to think I'm an expert at this. Yeah. I can't really see how a brand could ever get involved. Mm. That game is about eight years old, and when it came out, it underdelivered massively overpromised and underdelivered, and it got torn to pieces. The developers, Hello Games, have been um, spent the last eight years updating it, engaging with the Reddit community, listening, updating it. And I think they're like 15 or 16 updates in. About a year ago, the Reddit community bought the 48 sheet outside the office of the developers, the out-of-home placement, to say thank you. Oh. <laughs> and like, that's so that's so nice. awesome. yeah. that's, that's gamers being nice yeah. and I was like wow this is great yeah. that's, not, that's not toxic that's a fandom who genuinely cares about the developers who have made this game good mm. and have not given up mm. I don't know how a brand could get involved with that yeah. and I wouldn't really want to but if you've done your research to George's point you've done your research you would look at it and go actually there's not a way in here mm. fortunately for gaming there's thousands of different games, yes, right? So let's yes. find one that works for us. Yes, yeah. And when it comes to something like, um, like, like specifically when it comes to comic books, for example, you, you move from being a fan to actually then being involved in making this stuff, right? H how do you sort of, how do you sort of, you know, or like being involved in the fandom, sorry, I should say. Hmm. How do you sort of, you know, um, judge that space as being receptive or open to you know, engagement with brands that might want to might want to sort of be a part of that? Um, well, I mean, uh, I guess um, building upon what Georgie and James have said, it's easy to smell authenticity, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I guess when someone comes, someone that doesn't, that sounds worse than what I intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a stink. You can smell the, the stink yeah. comes off someone who's not authentic. And you know that... Um, it, it takes a conversation and not much of a conversation to work out if someone actually knows what they're talking about and whether they're actually genuinely enthused about what it is that you do. So, or that you, or that you all have the same sort of aspirations in respect of a character or a show or a game or, mm. or whatever it may be. And I think that, I mean, for me it was, you know, this is all what I do in my spare time, such mm. as it is, because I've got plenty of other things that keep me busy and I do it. Uh, as a passion project and I do it because I like talking to other people with the same interests and what it's done is <clears throat> um, kind of given me some expertise so that now I, I regularly talk to all sorts of different creators in the genre about what it is that they do and mm. uh, and have met some really interesting people and we all speak the same language. Yes. So my, you know, when I take my intellectual property lawyer's hat off and I put on my 
you know, comic book editor hat on. Yeah. Um, there's quite a bit of difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of bleed between the two roles. Yeah, that's fair mm-hmm. enough. Yeah. Um, I think y- you made some good points, James, like that No Man's Sky is, is a great example. Nobody wants to be that brand that comes into a community and, like, drops a clang or totally misreads, like, that's a great example. That that's a community doing something on their own, right? Obviously, if you're going to be making a connection with fans of a particular subject or a particular thing, their passion, object of fandom, like you say, Georgie, you've got to understand the house rules so you don't end mm-hmm. up doing sort of like, um, you know, like a Pepsi, Kendall Jenner situation, <laughs> right? Classic. You know? uh, classic, classic <laughs> clanger. What, <laughs> what are the best ways to make sure that, like, if you're involved already, right? So let's say, you know, you... You, you know, whether it's sometimes we luck into these things, whether it's a sponsorship or a partnership and mm-hmm. all of a sudden you become part of a, a community, um, how do you sort of show that you um, add value to that community? How, how can you sort of be sort of not just stealing or appropriating but, you know, building up and kind of, you know, leaving it better than you left? Uh, I think the there's two things at play. One is the points I made in my talk around depth, investment, commitment, time, patience. Yes. If you're in for the long haul, then you're in. Yeah. So the Oreo Xbox work was the first gaming piece we did. Since then, they've done Pac-Man, and I think they're just about to do Mario. Okay. So like we're in, we're into the gaming bit, and that's that's yes. that, as from an Oreo perspective. Um, what's Interesting to me is that there's not you don't always have to go ahead and shove a product into a game mm. to make something work like that. Mm. People that play video games care about the people that make the video games. Oftentimes, when they're really into that fandom, they want to know who those developers are and also want to know mm. that they're being paid and looked after and not being made redundant and not being burnt out. Um, another different way of looking at it might be to go, who are the developers making games right now? Could we invest or back or support up and coming developers? Emerging. Emerging developers. Yep. Just to so that our brand is associated with supporting young talent who's making great creative. Mm. And that creative doesn't have to be an ad, it could be a game. So that's, yep. to me, I think that's a much more interesting way of going, you know what, we, we're committed to this fandom, we're committed to people that play video games because mm. we're going to back developers. And that to me is more interesting. Yeah, I was just going to add to that slightly and say it's easy to come in at a viral moment and jump Mm -hmm. onto a fandom trend and, you know, my research is into Taylor Swift. Um, I've been a Swifty since 2008 and it's, you know, only in the past year with the Errors Tour that suddenly it's been cool to be a Swifty and suddenly Mm. every brand wants to be involved and so many of them are just jumping on the, you know, the friendship bracelet making trend and they just want to try and grab the eyeballs, but they haven't put any further care into it and they haven't Mm -hmm. put any further research into it and there's no real strategy behind it. And you don't want to be that brand that's just trying to grab the the quick eyes. You want to, you know, it might not be Taylor Swift because, you know, she's a superstar, but there are so many other artists out there and there are so many other fandoms out there. And if you do want to get involved, it's important to do that research and to find brand alignment and to find your reason why. It's not just to get any eyeballs. Yeah. You need to, you know, find the alignment. And it might never be a Taylor Swift moment, but that doesn't mean there's not a really passionate community of fans there for you to tap into. And too often I think brands are just so interested in the quick win. <laughs> and we cannot think about the quick win when it comes to fandom because yeah. it's really like a deep time commitment and something that people think of as part of their identity. And if you're going to be, you know, kind of talking and participating in something that means that much to somebody, yeah. you need to show that much care back because, yeah, otherwise it's just not going to work. Mm. George, you're an early adapter then, right? So you, yeah. <laughs> you must really look down your nose at people oh. who jump on the bandwagon way too late. Oh, yeah, with the, with the Swifties. I'm like, <laughs> guys, I have been um, – I was studying her before. <laughs> no, it was uh, – I was just very lucky with my timing because until that point nobody cared. <laughs> it was just another case study, but, yeah. It has but, been interesting watching okay, her. Okay, all right then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can't complain. Um, that, what you just mentioned, Dave, actually something I wanted to, to touch on uh, because it happens a lot in, in fandoms 
some more than others that, that, you know, some are known for their openness and acceptance of new members. I think maybe Swifties is a great example of that. And others, there's just such hard gatekeeping Mm -hmm. where it's like, well, you know, you don't meet the standard or the criteria of being an actual fan, you know, like a big criticism of Drive to Survive is that it's, they're not real Formula <laughs> One fans, right? Yeah, because horrendous. you weren't watching in the dark mm-hmm. days when Bernie Ecclestone was in charge and, you know, like <laughs> people were literally dying on like a fortnightly basis in race. You know, there's this sort of like, there's that kind of tension there. And, you know, some, uh, you know, comic books is, is probably a world where there's actually, unfortunately, a lot of almost very toxic gatekeeping as well. Oh, hell um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Look, it's such an obscure little... Oh, actually, that's a complete lie. You know, there was a guy called Warren Ellis who wrote a book called Come In Alone in 2003 who predicted the death of the industry. He said, (laughs) this is going nowhere. It's like you're all writing superhero comics. They're all crap. It's like as if you (laughs) went into a shop and there were nothing but books on nurses... You know, so what? What are, what are your options here? Oh, a nurse, oh, another a hospital nurse. Yeah. What are you doing writing about the same genre of people who uh, look like they should be in pro wrestling wearing capes? You know, what's what's the point? And then, of course, you know, Iron Man came out, and suddenly mm-hmm. everyone thought, "Oh, hey, well, here's this, here's this, you know, kind of kind of weird sort of genre of adventure that suddenly became incredibly popular." And, you know, we're talking about sort of OG fans, you know, mm. all, all of us who actually have kind of weathered the storm and yeah. thinking that the entire industry was going to fall over and kind of suddenly gone, well, what are you doing yeah. here? You know, what the hell? What are you up yeah, to Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. 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 What, what were you reading back in 2003? Yeah, I guarantee you it wasn't superhero comics. So, so um, yeah, I mean, and I don't know how you deal with that. And, and um, I, guess, I guess if you're looking at it from a branding perspective, you know, in terms of, trying to forge strategic alliances with fandoms. You look for the, those key gatekeepers mm. and you try to persuade them that you are genuine, you are actually concerned, yes. um, you've got a real interest in it and you're trying to help the fandom as opposed to milk them for money. Yes, yes, I think <clears throat> that makes that makes good sense. I think it uh, sounds like the right approach. I think, however, though, is there maybe an argument for if a community does have that sort of hardcore gatekeeping, is there an argument to say that's not the right community, it's not a brand safe space? I think it really depends um, and I think sometimes... That's the key theme of this conference. Everyone's <laughs> dumb. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Like but lawyers. often there'll <laughs> be... <laughs> like lawyers. What are, what are <laughs> like there'll be aspects of a fandom that can be super gatekeepy but that'll just be one tiny part of the fandom that doesn't necessarily speak for everyone. Okay. Um, I think, you know, even with the Swifties, there were people having this crazy argument the other day because apparently people were, I don't know why anybody cares about this, but people were allegedly lying about the year they became a fan. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, oh, you're saying you've been here since 2007, but I'm like, yeah. how could you? You were only this old. And Show me your red tattoo to prove literally, that. Literally. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, does it? Does it matter? So yeah. you can find these weird gatekeepy things. I think, you know, maybe in gaming and comic books it can get more problematic, those kind of um, – where there is more toxicity than, say, some more mainstream, like your Taylor Swifts, like a lot of your sports. Yes, there will be corners that are gatekept, but when something's very mainstream more broadly, mm. there are still safe ways to get involved. But I think if, a, if something has a reputation for being toxic, definitely – stay away even if there are nice people within it like you don't want there's too much brand risk there i would say there's a tipping point right where Mm. small communities want are very inclusive they want people to hear about how wonderful it is their obscure little passion is and then if it gets to the point of actually being successful suddenly that all switches Mm. and well hang on a minute i'm i was here first and i've got more knowledge than what you do and there's that kind of um <clears throat> you know, almost like Tension. some sort of repulsion, yeah, yeah towards yeah, yeah. the fact that it's yeah. it's being popularised mm-hmm. and that, you know, you're not worthy kind of vibe to it. I think the, the I mean, you touched on it, Dave, There's it's a fine line, there's a tipping point because some of that can be um, uh, sort of like uh, the sort of status seeking within these communities mm. and which is a valid mm-hmm. part of our fandoms, you know, not not the gate, not the toxic gatekeeping <laughs> but the sort of like, oh, wow, this person on this forum knows so much about if we talk about Formula One, about the history of the Red Bull racing team between 2010 and 2015, <laughs> like they are the GOAT, like it's a status kind of indicator. Mm. So, um, and sometimes it's gained through competition, gained through like, you know, the skin example is a good one. Um, sometimes it's gained just through, I guess, being an active moderator in a community and being sort of very responsive. 
it strikes me that that's kind of like a bit of an untapped area for brands in the sense that, you know, first, of course, to prove they are uh, as worthy a fan as themselves, if you like, as others in the community, but then to also kind of demonstrate their commitment to growing that fandom in a positive way. Do you think some kind of like healthy competition or, you know, I hate this word, but gamification could be a smart way for, for brands to sort of, um, you know, um, add value rather than just sort of jumping on things? Good, so can I can I take your question and make it really specific for Georgie for a minute? Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So in your presentation, you mm-hmm. talked about how Swifties use TN times number. Yes. To demonstrate how often Taylor Nation, who is the fan... What, it's her she, marketing team, her basically. Her marketing yeah. team had interacted with them. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine a world where a brand would have a TN number? I think there are certain brands... Um, you know, your really like popular kind of cool brands, um, but it would have to be, it's not just being noticed. It has to be like for a value reason. Mm -hmm. So they, your notice by Taylor gives you status in the community and kind of that idea of a hierarchy, um, because that is valued within the community. So attention is more important than knowledge or spend of money or what, like every community has a different, um, value system in their in the creation of their hierarchies. So um, I actually explored hierarchies in my PhD research and a lot of the work that had been done was on your more traditional forms of fandom, like your, you know, your TV fandoms and your um, comic fandoms where it is a lot around time, um, uh, time knowledge, um, mm. so being able to, you know, show your how much you know and also, as you were mentioning, like, having a position of power like being a moderator um, or, you know, creating fan events. Um, Whereas in the Taylor Swift fandom and increasingly in other forms of celebrity fandom, the value is in things like having met the celebrity, being noticed. Um, And so if you do have a community where, you know, maybe I, I can't even think of an example right now, but where there is a reason to want to be engaged by that brand and Mm -hmm. it does you know, give you something in return, then I think there could be. And, you know, you see it, um, for example, I think we can't, I don't like NFTs in Web3 and I don't think they belong in fandom. That's a whole other issue. (laughs) But some of the Formula One teams are still trying to do it. McLaren is. is, Yeah, McLaren McLaren and and Red Bull. And Red Bull have a thing in their fan club where if you get a certain amount of engagement with their NFTs, you can get a special Discord um, badge, yeah, yeah. and they uh. they they're, they're like, oh, this is what you're valuing, and I'm like, no, that's what you're valuing, and what your sponsors are valuing. Yeah. No, that badge means nothing. It means everything to you. Nothing within the fandom. Whereas the TN didn't come from Taylor Nation. They didn't tell their fans yeah. to do that. The status came naturally from within the fandom and it's something that can't be forced. It's not something that if a brand told you to do it, you're just kind of like, well, that's why, why would I? Yeah. Yeah. But if it comes up organically and I think that's kind of the tension. That's the key. That's the, Mm. the, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm amazed we're still talking about NFTs in 2024. Right. Yeah. I thought, I thought they were done. Oh, and yet. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, that's a whole other, that's a whole other podcast. We're not going to record. (laughs) I'm being very quiet, but I don't own any NFTs. No, yeah. yeah. You know what I, you know what I say? You want to say you don't endorse NFTs. Don't don't have have a view. No. Um, Before we wrap up our chat, I want to ask you to all play Fast and loose with your opinions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave is going to appeal more to your comic book side and your lawyer side, probably. Okay. Quick, um, change hats. <laughs> <laughs> change hats. Stuck. I have some uh, brief questions which I will uh, ask, uh, ask a question of each of you randomly. Why don't you give me the first thing that comes into your head and the rest okay. of us can agree, disagree, shake our head violently, whatever we feel is right. I saw him do this the other day. I'm terrified. You create a new substance that can shape online culture. Create it in your lab, right? What one thing would you hope to change online for the better with this substance? No, this is my lawyer hat, right? So this, <laughs> this is definitely because which is which is all about prevention. It's yeah. just you know first, uh, you know, my in my seminar I said get insurance, right? Yeah. Because you just don't know. <laughs> don't know. So everyone's everyone's going to come after you. You know, get insurance. The second thing, because I'm talking fast. The second thing is. Um, you know, be aware. Don't go and step on someone else's rights. Don't go and, you know, trample someone else's product or brand or goodwill or image mm, or whatever yeah. it is. Just think about these things. Third thing is, you know, switch your brain off. You know, if you think you're going to go off and say something really, really stupid, just stop, have a pause, make sure you're not going to say anything defamatory, which is then going to make your next 
three years of your life miserable because someone's <laughs> actually chasing you. It's that, I think, so, you you, you know, here's the magic substance. That, that's it. Just hesitate and pause. Hesitate and pause. <laughs> yeah, before you do something stupid and it's going to go off and really irritate someone, just have a little think about it I first. think that's great advice for Mark. This to just hesitate <laughs> and pause, actually. You should bottle that and sell it in the pharmacy. Yeah, the yeah. online <laughs> the, this, pause, this, this, bottle of pause. pause. Yeah. Yeah. Magical <laughs> substance, a bottle of pause, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you just tell it it's empty. You just like that smart water. It's like, oh, it's definitely got botanicals in it. Yeah. Yeah. It tastes delicious. Yeah. Uh, all right, James, you're next. As an alchemist, you uh, rewrite the laws of the universe with your new discoveries every time. What's the latest thing that you've learned that you want the audience to know about too? The difference between fan and fandoms that I learned in George's talk just now <laughs> genuinely has been yeah. life-changing for me. Like the way I think about fans and fandoms, particip- participation versus versus really leaning into it. Some people just buy T-shirts. Other people are active participants of the community. Mm. Um, understanding that difference because so many brands, and I'm, I'm repeating your words, um, so many brands flagrantly, flagrantly, Easily for that word around <laughs> uh, to to talk about their own fans yeah. and you're not you're not creating fandoms they just buy your shoes yeah. they're not going out and making you know like big posters saying thanks for the shoes, for the shoes. they're not doing that <laughs> yeah. it's not a fan they're not buying ads outside your your yeah, studio exactly. for the game you, yeah. you've just you've just got customers yeah. and that's okay yes um, but that difference is really clear to me now and I, I only like learned that. that literally an hour ago that's good I did ask you for uh, you know the 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 latest thing you've learned. So it's, uh, we couldn't get any, any, any more <laughs> up to date. Georgie, your turn. Mm-hmm. As an alchemist, you, the marketing masses come to you for insights about what the future holds mm. to gaze into your crystal ball. <laughs> What's the biggest internet trend that you see coming to an end in the next year? Oh, it's so hard because so many trends are um, over in a matter of days yes yes like you know i feel so, yes. like you know i just get my head around like brat summer and then it went to mure, know, and yeah, then we're yeah. all gone i think i don't know if it's going to end so much but i think it's going to be interesting to see what's happening with social video because tiktok keeps getting longer and then it's mm. like at what point do we just like is that just YouTube? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what and you know, Instagram still try and push reels, but it's like what are we what is happening there? And I don't and I think we either need to decide what sort of video we're doing or it's all going to kind of just just fizzle out. Yes, I just realized I'm making hand signs in a in a in podcast. A, in a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there's not great. Yeah, <laughs> there's, the there's, there's evidence fizzling. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. you know, TikTok for a long time had its its whole hook being those short videos. Yeah. But it's like if that's no longer your thing, what is your platform is your, offering? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been actually a really mind-expanding uh, conversation <laughs> and um, a topic that I think, you know, certainly we've heard a lot about actually at this conference, this first conference I've, I've – I've attended where there's been so many people touching on this in one way or another, um, and um, it's been it's been a really really fascinating conversation. So, Dave, Georgie, James, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining me on the show, and uh, go out there and make the most of the rest of State of Social. Thank, thank you. you very Thanks, much. Ava. Thank you. Cheers. There is plenty more to wrap your ears around on The Alchemists, including heaps of in-depth chats with this year's State of Social speakers. So make sure you follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, give us a five-star review and tell a mate or two or three. Tell your mum. The Alchemists is a co-production of State of Social and Creative Fix. The show is produced by me, Andres Lopez Varela, and Aaron Matthews from Creative Fix, with additional production support by Cal McLean. Meg Coffey is our executive producer. On behalf of all the alchemists, I'm AOV. I'll catch you next time.